Welcome to the session. Um, I've got a couple of cool uh, security features that are available on github.com. All of them are available for free when you have public repositories, and that is why I want to show that for the people who work on open source stuff. Uh, most of the stuff needs a license if you use this in your business. But in an open source community, it's uh, um, something that most people don't know that this even exists. So that is why I want to share that as much as possible. I call myself a DevOps consultant and a GitHub trainer. I've been giving uh, a lot of focus on the GitHub platform for the last three years. And I teach people all the time on how to use these kinds of features, for example. And they're so uh, simple to add to your repository that I need to share that everywhere that I can. I'm based in the Netherlands, so I flew in uh, late last night. Um, I work for uh, ZBI Expert. I should actually update the slide. I've got my uh, blog in the uh, lower left-hand side as well of all the slides, so you can get all that information later on as well. And I've even got a QR code at the end where you can grab all the slides with all the links that I'm showing you there so that you can really get started and see all of the features that I'm talking about. What are we going to talk about? Some of the security features that we have there, uh, starting with commit signing, because I think that's an interesting one that most people just forget about, and that can really make your setup a lot more secure. And then we'll go over most of the other features as well. Um, dependable security alert, secret scanning, CodeQL is part of what they call advanced security on the GitHub platform. Uh, and such a nice setup that they have now that they're even bringing that over to Azure DevOps, been announced yesterday as well, and uh, that they're pulling some of the features over to that side as well. Um, so this is becoming more and more common to have, uh, even if you're not using GitHub itself um, for those things as well. Why am I actually talking about this? Uh, and this is always interesting because we always think about attack vectors as developers on our code, um, seeing what the things we're pulling into, for example, what dependencies are you pulling into your application, um, what kind of code are you baking, making, and in there, every time I join a new company as a consultant, I still need to go in, chat with developers, and ask them, for example, who has um, knowledge about what the OWASP top 10 means. And I wanted to do a check here as well. Hands up. Do you know about the OWASP top 10? It's like three people uh, raising their hands right now. Four. That's just scary. We've been doing this for over a decade now. The OWASP Foundation is a foundation that focuses on a lot of research, uh, a lot of open research as well. I think most of it is open. The OWASP top 10 is one of the uh, top 10 attack vectors that we have in our code. The one thing that is always on this list is SQL injection attacks. Who knows about those? So you do know a little bit about those patterns. The top 10 is uh, something that they have an uh, inquiry about every year where they try to get as much people to join and talk about those things. Have you found a SQL injection attack in your company, for example? And they share then the top 10 of most hit vulnerabilities. And it's scary that a lot of people that I joined don't know about the OWASP top 10 at all, let alone people coming from school. They haven't been told about these things as well. So this is usually where we think of app security, application security, and we need to protect against. But these days, we see more and more attacks happening in your pipelines as well. So every time you build something, you pull things from a package manager, and you push something into a uh, to an environment, maybe production, all of those things are now attack vectors as well. Just a, a, another check. Who here considers themselves a developer? Who here maintains CI CD pipelines? Who here does not store their CI CD pipelines in code? Awesome. So we store these things as code in our repositories. And then you need to start thinking about all of those attack vectors as well. I got some more examples coming up later on. So that whole breadth of the things that we touch as developers is now possible an attack vector. So you need to think about who has access to those things. And something super simple that you can do inside of GitHub, if you have the right app and permissions, you can go into settings and actually check who has right access to your repository. Because all of those people can potentially make changes to your pipeline definitions as well, let alone all of the packages that you pull in from a dependency manager, for example. Every once in a while, I'll pull this open at a company that I joined, and then I say, who the heck is this person? Yeah, they left two years ago and they still have right access to your repository. So hopefully there's some good IDP identity uh, access control around that. But this can be super interesting. Why am I talking about that? Because these are some of the things we've been using to push code into our repositories. And these are the normal things that people know about. You either use SSH or HTTPS inside of a Git repository. In a public repository on github.com, any authenticated user has read access to everything in your repository. 
including your pipeline logs, as long as they're logged into GitHub.com. They can um, uh, search around, try to find vulnerabilities in there, and send in a pull request. And depending on how you have set up your pull request, that could already be a potential attack vector into your pipeline as well. Just to set your minds in that direction as well. But these are the things most people know about. On the GitHub platform, we also have deploy keys that you can configure uh, for a single key that can push something into a repository. We have machine users, also called service accounts. We have GitHub apps, a GitHub token. There's lots and lots of ways to get access to your repository. So every once in a while, you need to think about it. Why am I even talking about this? This is all leading up to how do you actually push your code into your repositories? Well, you're developers, most of you. So you run a Git configuration, say this is my email address, um, do that locally, and then every time you commit something locally, that email address will be assigned to that commit. That email address is used on the GitHub platform to match the user to an actual user on the platform because they have configured that email address as their communication channel as well. So they don't use any authentication method for matching the commits assigned with an email address to a specific user on the platform. So that means that this information, when you open up a repository saying this person made these changes, is only assigned or linked to that user with their email address. Well, why is that so bad? I've been a trainer for a long time. I do this continuously, and I write commits in other people's names and push them into their repositories, into even public ones which means I can get your email address, and if you haven't provided any good setup that I'm going to show you in just a second, I'm now making commits in your name, which will be shown all over the world, and that can potentially be very scary. Because this is, of course, what we do, right? Make some changes, do git add, commit them, and push them into a repository. I can automate that for you. What you want to do is start working with commit sign. And this is always interesting, uh, because this is usually the part where I ask who here considers them a developer, but most of you do. Who here has set up two-factor authentication for their login to GitHub.com? They're going to make that required, I think, in the summer now. So that's already a good setup. That's a starting point. Commit signing, I see that as two-factor authentication for your commits as well. Who here is already using commit signing? Wow, it's more hands than I've seen in other conferences, so that's very good. With commit signing, you have a private key, and uh, you were, use that locally to assign your commits, and then you push your code into GitHub. GitHub has the public version of your key, and they can match if your uh, commit has been signed with a key that they know. And then stuff becomes way more secure, of course. Hence, two-factor authentication around commit signing. I got a short URL in the bottom that you can find later to find more information on how to get started with these things as well. There are three different ways to do that. One is uh, GPG keys that has been around the longest. Uh, they're still in SMIME format. I have not, not used that at all. And since last year, we can actually use SSH keys as well. So if you're comfortable with using that, then that can definitely be a, a plus. Uh, one thing to add, I'm a Windows user, so I use that as well. GPG key part works flawlessly on Windows with a little bit of setup. Can be tricky to set up, but then at least it works. SSH keys really suck, especially when you start including passphrases and include them in your editor. I work a lot with VS Code, and that becomes a bit harder. But you set it up, you give GitHub the uh, public version of your key, you have your private key locally, so now GitHub can actually check if you're signing your commit with a key that they know. How does it work? Jump just a simple, normal uh, GitHub command, you add a dash capital S in there saying, I'm signing my commits. Well, I'm a developer as well most of the time, so uh, that means that I'm lazy as well. So you can also configure that globally and say GPG commit signing is true for every single commit that I do on my machine. So what actually then happens, make sure that we actually have a short demo for this. Um, because this makes it super simple to see how things work. My laptop wants to collaborate. When I have a terminal, I'll zoom in a bit. Um, 
and I have some changes in here. I can open up code. I have a repository, of course. Make some changes. And I have this integrated in uh, Git itself. So Git knows that whenever it does a commit, it needs to pop up a message saying, hey, who the heck are you? I have two-factor authentication set up, so I have a passphrase included as well. So even when I, when I run git commit, um, with a message, of course, saying uh, hello, ah, here's as well. Um, I need to git add first. That will give me a pop-up. I should have started this earlier. Because this is the service on Windows that's actually loading my local certificates. Darn it. This takes a bit longer than I expected. So I'll just continue uh, from the slides. This usually starts when I boot my laptop, but every once in a while it has a small issue in here. But luckily I came prepared and I have some backups. Because then I get a pop-up from my Windows server saying, hey, you're running something with git commit. So this works in any editor if you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, uh, or just the plain old. And here's, of course, uh, I have it on my screen. There's my pop-up asking me for a passphrase. Because similar to what you can do in an SSH key, you can actually include a passphrase in your setup as well. That is something that I need to type in, hence the two-factor part. And uh, you can even go even further with that. For example, you can configure your GPG key to be installed on your YubiKey. Who here has a YubiKey? Only one person. It's the two-factor part. Uh, I've got one in my bag. It's super small. That's why I have a big picture, of course, uh, of it. It's something you need to plug into your laptop, actually touch to unlock, and then it can uh, read your GPG key, for example. So you can even configure your setup with that. You can even do that for your entire enterprise. Say everybody gets a GPG key. I preload all the certificates that I'm giving out as an administrator uh, to my users. Um, preload that with github.com, for example, and then enforce commit signing on everything that we have in there, making it way more secure than just trusting that somebody is using the email address uh, in good faith. When you start doing that, instead of just this person has signed this commit, you will actually go to verification messages. You can enable that on the platform, and that will nicely show this commit has been signed by a person, and we could verify the signature that was in there as well. And this will show up everywhere where you have a commit SHA hash in the, uh, in the screen. So everywhere where that is enabled, you now see verified signature, so you know you can trust that that person actually made the commit instead of somebody just misusing an email address somewhere. There's an extra feature called vigilant mode that you need to set up on your um, user level. So if you go to user settings, and you can find that as well. Uh, and another short link in the bottom here as well. Which means that I, as an author, want every single commit shown on the GitHub platform to be shown with that verification message in there. So wherever somebody makes a commit with my email address, you will see if that actually is signed and linked to my signature. Two-factor authentication for your commits. So there are three states there, verified, partially verified, and unverified. Uh, and this is what they mean. So verified is the biggest one, of course. So the commit is actually signed. We can verify the signature belonging to the user. And the user that has a signature also matches the email address that is linked to the user. If that is so, then you will see verified. With partially verified, you get a message saying, hey, we could, for example, verify the signature, but the email address doesn't match because something was messed up. And even if you hover over that, this is a bit small, but it says this commit is not signed, but one or more authors requires that any commit attributed to them is signed. So that is what I have on my setup. Anywhere where somebody pushes a commit with my email address and I didn't sign it, you will get this uh, message as well. You can even then go so far into your branch protection rules, and there's a uh, setting there that says required signed commits. So you can go into your branch protection rules, say we need a, a pull request whenever somebody makes a change to the default branch, and every change they're bringing in has to be signed, otherwise they cannot commit and cannot merge. Improving your security with that setup as well. There is, of course, a little bit of impact there. Your user actually needs to set this up, 
And there are some integrations that GitHub has um, that need to be configured as well. Luckily, Dependabot, for example, does that automatically for you. But if you use automation, like a GitHub app, or you still use a personal access token, then you will need to set up a way that they can verify or set up those signatures as well, and sign the commits that they make as well. So be aware then when you do this. Codespaces, luckily, has a setting in the user setting saying, every code space that I make, or for certain repositories, uh, will transparently set up a GPG key for me and use that without me changing anything on the system as well. So the integration points that GitHub has already know about this, and it can work with that as well. One important thing, and that is something that is lacking in here as well, so either use a YubiKey, something that you physically have there, or use an actual passphrase. And the hard part is that you cannot enforce that. The passphrase in YubiKey is something that we call um, a presence of a user, so you need to actually do something to prove that the user is there, but you don't see that in the signature right now. It's something that I would like to see the industry improving, uh, but there's currently no way to enforce that. So you're still trusting that the user has set up certain things, especially with a sign-in key, because you can also um, set up a commit signing, signing key, without a passphrase. And then we're back at square one, because it can now still automate the commits in your name. So there is some, uh, some, some uh, things lacking with that as well. What's this interesting so far? Who is going to play with commit signing? especially vigilant mode on your public account. It's super easy to then set up and from then on. Uh, anywhere where your email address is being shown, um, you will get that information as well. Got one more thing in between. It's my first conference uh, this year in Europe, and we do say at our company we need to do epic shit. And I've got shirts to give away. I think I have three with me today. If you want one, get me a cool conference picture that I can share afterwards, and then I'll hand you out a shirt. Because this is uh, something that I would say for me is doing epic shit as well. So that is where they, that logo came from. Let's continue because I think we're short on time already. Um, Dependabot. Who already knows about Dependabot? Who uses it for version updates? Who uses it for anything else? Cool. That's why you're here. Dependabot, uh, in its basis, is knowing what you have inside of your repository. Dependable scans your uh, repository for what we call manifest files, so package.json uh, or a CS project file, for example, goes through that and figures out what your dependencies are. So the packages you're pulling in from a package manager, nuget.org or npm, for example, picks that up. Uh, and this is a feature that is free available for public repositories. It's enabled by default for most public repositories. So you're free to use that uh, and continue um, learn from it. If it knows what kind of packages you're pulling in from a package manager, it can then also start updating all of the packages for you. That's what most people already know about, so version updates. Uh, and this is a configuration file that has to be stored in the right location on the default branch. Uh, I got a short link here with all of the magic configuration stuff that is possible on the GitHub platform, because that's super interesting to see what is there. With this configuration, I've set for uh, the package ecosystem npm in the root of the repository, search for that on a weekly basis, and match all of the packages that I have with the package manager, and if there's a newer version available of that package, then pull it in and send me in a pull request. That's what most people already know. If you don't do that, then uh, you usually already fall behind with the packages you're using from uh, the package manager as well, uh, and then you're dependent on the most senior person in the team, usually that every once in a while says, in this case, npm update, get everything to the latest version. Who is that person for their team? Holy crap, so you're relying that somebody else does that for you? I've been in that situation as a team lead as well, uh, and I was lucky if did, I did this three times a year. With Dependabot, you can automate that and always stay up to date with the latest version, uh, and that already by itself can make you a lot more secure as well. Um, yes, let's do a short demo. just to get uh, everybody on the same page. D 
This is an example of Dependable picking up uh, package files from my repository. I have something in NPM here. I'll make it a bit more large for the people in the back. It says we are dependent on ESLint in this repository. We are using version 8.37. Uh, and 8.39 came out. I'm doing this on a weekly basis, and we all know the speed of which our dependencies go with in the package managers, the open source world, that goes fast. So this is uh, weekly, so it says, hey, there are already two version bumps. This is following semantic versioning, so the version has a meaning. As long as the first one, that's what we call them, uh, we call them all three major, minor, and then uh, patch updates. The convention is, as long as the first number stays the same, there are no breaking changes, so you should be able to upgrade with relatively ease. GitHub knows that we're pulling that in through a package uh, manifest file in our repository, in this case, uh, package.json. Uh, knows we're pulling in ESLint. It sees that we have 8.37 in use, and it knows that there's a newer version on npmgs.org, so it can propose that change, and already merged uh, some changes in. The nice thing is that this is GitHub, so they're very enforced or, or known in the open source community, so they actually can go in and see that ESLint is a repository hosted on github.com, so you get a deep link back to the repository as well. And it can even pull in release notes, for example, from those changes as well. So you can do some due diligence here, checking out what are the actual changes I'm pulling in. And not just by trusting the release notes, you can even see all the commits that were made. And depending on how they are set up, you can even get a message in here saying, hey, there's a commit in here from a first time contributor to that repository, which is always then interesting because is this an actual uh, benevolent helper that is building stuff or are they trying to slip in something? So from a security perspective, this is definitely helpful to uh, have a deeper dive into as well. So this gives you more information. Even better is that compatibility score. GitHub uh, uses GitHub Actions as pipelines. Who here knows about GitHub Actions? Who here has used them? Somewhat. It's their version of CI CD, but way more than that. You can do so much automation with GitHub Actions as well. I can trigger a pipeline, a workflow, uh, based on when somebody labels an issue, for example, or when somebody creates a page on a wiki. I can automate my way around the platform left and right. Dependable proposes these kinds of pull requests and then checks how many times do the automated pipelines actually work or fail. So it gives you more of a confidence score saying, hey, 75% of the time when I propose this specific version update for this specific package, I see that uh, the version of the, the checks that are being made in the repositories, in this case, are successful, so 75%. And as long as that is lower than 80, they already make the button orange and say, maybe you want to check if you have enough confidence in your own CI CD setup to say, can I continue with this uh, version upgrade, yes or no? So with that information, uh, me being a DevOps engineer, I usually have a good CI CD system. So with that, I can make the decision, can I pull in these changes, yes or no? If I really want to go off the deep end, I can go into this compare view and see all of the commits that were made here. And in the bottom, they usually also say, show the files changed. So I can really do some due diligence here saying, this is the actual update that I'm pulling in. Last week, I gave this session for Visual Studio developers. And then there you have a pop-up from NuGet. And it just says an exclamation mark, you're pulling in updates, and you're falling behind, and that's it. Click the big update all button, and then you're magically updated. With this, you actually can do some due diligence of seeing what you're updating to. In this case, uh, this is just a bug report that they're updating. There's just some version updates. So I have way more information and feeling if this is something I can trust or not. That is dependable. Dependable is a bot. So that means you can actually communicate with it. So you can also say, for example, I want to ignore this major version or a minor version or this specific dependency. So you have all sorts of ways to uh, communicate with the bot and tell it what to do. If it needs to rebase it, you give it a, a, command, a comment message on the issue or on the pull request, and it will rebase it for you as well. So that was a short demo of how it works. I always have uh, uh, screen caps in here in case GitHub is down or in case somebody else later on wants to see the, uh, the slides so you actually have the information. I talked about the change log and the commits. It's a nice way to check if I actually told you everything that I wanted to tell you. 
All the changes, we talked about that as well. Um, the change log, we handle that. All the commit messages, that is in there. Uh, and then communicating with the bot where I just left off. Communication can also be done explicitly through that dependable config file. So you can say in the config file, I want to uh, forward the dependency express, I want to ignore version four and five. So you can be super explicit with your team members saying that version, we looked at it, but upgrading is not something we want to do now. We want dependable to hash up about it for a while. Shut up. This is how you configure that super explicitly. You can also do that for an entire dependency. Say, like, hey, we know that this is something that moves fast for now. I just want to ignore uh, because I have other things to do. It's also something then that you can explain, saying, yeah, we codified this now. It's super visible for everybody. Why the hell are we skipping over those things? But if you have the need, uh, then you have uh, the option as well. And in this case as well, for the AWS SDK, I know that thing goes so fast, we're ignoring all semantic versioning patch updates. For the last number updates, this is going so fast, skip those giving me less noise and less pull requests to work with. So you have a lot of configuration options for this as well. When Dependable proposes a pull request, it even keeps track of what is happening. So in this case, it proposed a pull request from version 5.20 to 5.23, and then it said, uh, there's a newer version coming up. Should probably flip those. Uh, it then automatically closes the old pull request and creates a new one. So you have full service and you don't rely anymore on the most senior person in the team every once in a while running updates for your package dependencies. That's a good starting point to at least stay up to date with the latest version updates. An even better improvement is then telling Dependable, hey, if you know that there's an issue with my, one of my dependencies with a version, give me your security update. Give me your security alert. Again, free for public repositories. It already knows which versions you're pulling in, and there's a whole database online by the NIST Institute in America called the National Vulnerability Database, where they store each package with its version, and if there's an issue with that, they annotate that specific uh, version as well, saying there's a category four security uh, leak here, and you need to do something. So if the dependable already knows about those versions, it can generate the alerts for you. So if the dependency has a vulnerability, it will generate that alert, you can enable that from settings and encode security and analysis, uh, but you need to make a decision on, I want to be alerted on that. So it's not on by default. I hope it will become the default. Um, so then it will at least start generating the alerts. Well, another short demo. Dependable has analyzed my uh, repository. I have a to-do list in here, so there should be a package JSON and package log JSON in here, so that is what it picks up. Uh, and the nice thing is, if you go into insights and you're logged in into github.com, for any public repository, you can get access to that list because it's publicly available, the manifest file is already there, so you're sharing that as well. So if you go into the dependency graph, and they're currently working a bit on the screen, you can get insights on all the dependencies they're pulling in. And the nice part was, initially, they were actually showing the numbers here as well. So I, usually what I do here is go to github.com slash npm slash CLI. Who here uses npm? Not that many people. Who here is then C-sharp user? OK. npm drives, of course, uh, the JavaScript world a lot. I'm logged in. I'm not a contributor to this repository, but I can go into the dependency graph and see what is in there. This was initially showing me 80 dependencies that they were pulling in directly from the manifest uh, that they have. Well, this is built by developers as well, and developers are lazy, so if they have something that they can reuse from another library, they're going to reuse it. So your dependency is probably built on other dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies. They're currently revamping that screen, but uh, previously I could just open up these layers and then after 10 clicks I usually was bored because that is how deep those de uh, dependency graphs actually go. Anywhere if there's an issue along the line, that might bubble up and become a vulnerability. NPM CLI is something that most people actually use when they do something with Node.js, and it had 80 um, first layer dependencies in there. You can also see who is dependent on the GitHub of on the uh, NPM CLI. 
there's more than 100,000 open source repositories that in their manifest file have a dependency on whatever is output in this repository. So a small issue in one of the dependencies of the NPM CLI might lead to a bigger issue in the whole community. We've seen those types of attack with left path, for example, where they yanked a package that did nothing else than left path. And then uh, a lot of the, uh, the industry couldn't build their packages anymore because somewhere in that package stream, there was a dependency on the package and the package was gone. So this is why we're talking about this, super important. But also there's 103 packages being built from this repository that go out into the ecosystem. So it's not only turtles all the way down, but also all the way up. So this is giving you a little bit about the scope of what we're talking about when we talk about supply chain management. Going back to my uh, demo repository that I have, you can already see that I have critical issues in here saying, hey, we have a dependable alert. EGS has a vulnerability, so it's found in the package log file. I need to do something there. Well, if you've enabled all those alerts, you can go into security, and we have vulnerability alerts for dependable in here. And this is a demo repo, so I temporarily pause those things, but we can still see that. Then, hey, there's a vulnerability with automatic mongoose. I have no idea why I'm pulling that in, but there's a vulnerability in there, and my application is probably using it, so I need to upgrade. That's already warning one. So I can go in there, uh, and there's a whole scoring mechanism on a scale from zero to 10 on how feasible it is that this vulnerability ends up in my application. And you need to be aware that the binaries from this uh, uh, repository or dependency are also deployed into my production environment. So even if I'm not using the code, it might still be vulnerable in some way as well on the machine. We calculate that with a common vulnerability security system, a way that is also a bit disputed in the industry now, but this is at least a starting point of having a discussion on why is this an issue? And it starts by talking about these base metrics. The attack factor is coming in through the network, so you don't need to compromise the machine anymore. The attack complexity is high, but it's still doable. You don't need any privilege escalation, and you don't need any user interaction. So this already goes high up on the score of if this is somewhere deployed in production, this definitely might be misused relatively uh, easily, except for the complexity. That is where the scoring comes from. So that's why we have a score of seven. And it gives you more information, saying is this specific package, uh, you can even go back to the NPM ecosystem, all versions prior to this one were affected, and the patch version is this. We know that we're using 5.12, so that is why we get an alert saying, hey, we match your dependencies, uh, and we found an issue, patch this thing as soon as possible. You can even learn more about what is happening, and there's even links back to the weaknesses enumeration database. So as a developer, you can go there and learn if this is a SQL injection attack, is this a regular DDoS expression uh, that attack that can happen, and learn more about these kinds of attack vectors. So you can educate yourself as well. So there's all sorts of information tied to this that can help you. It even then says, hey, there's already a security update enabled as well. I've enabled on all my, on my repositories that when Dependable finds an issue with one of my dependencies, and it knows that there is a newer version available that no longer has the vulnerability in it, propose a pull request. I've got my CI CD system that checks everything, uh, if everything still works, and if I'm comfortable, then I can just merge in the pull request and continue with my life, instead of really diving into all of the issues that I need to fix. So in this case, this is an older one, so the compatibility is not known. But you can see the idea, right? We're pulling in just a version update, and that should be relatively trivial if we do this continuously. And uh, we have a good CI CD uh, harness that gives us enough confidence that we can actually merge these things in. So if you have to set up, you still need to review that as a human, of course, and then you can merge those changes in, uh, making your life a lot easier. And now you're keeping up to date with all the security vulnerabilities that were found and their updates that are available. Just to check that I didn't miss anything, so we found potential security vulnerabilities. That's already a win, because now you actually get an alert. You can go to an alert overview page, and this even bubbles up into an organization level. So if you have someone in your organization called the CISO, for example, uh, then they can look at these things as well. And we've seen the, the scurry last year saying, do we have Log4j in the house? This is where you find out, because this will show that for every repository in your organization. Are we pulling that in, yes or no? It is a separate setting, so you need to make a choice saying, I want that as well. 
It's not something that you can enable and you will get version updates automatically, the alerts automatically, and the pull request automatically. You as a team need to decide, do we want to pull this in, yes or no? I have this enabled for everything that I uh, uh, build myself as well. Well, we have then the pull request mechanism again, um, and I showed you the security alerts on top of this as well. So that is dependent bolt with secrets uh, alerts on top of that. Who will start enabling this on their public repos as soon as possible? It's, it's there, it's for free, and it's relatively trivial to, uh, to enable, and then at least learn from those things as well. Again, instead of being dependent on somebody in your team every once in a while running an update. Then it's a good time to start talking about secret scanning. You've probably all read the news, we've seen that for ages, somebody's AWS S3 bucket key has leaked and now all of our customer data has leaked as well. So we're not necessarily only talking about securing those setups from a good perspective, because why the hell do you need an S3 bucket open to the entire internet? Probably you only need it for your web application. But also about leaking those kinds of keys. Most of the tools that we use have an API token mechanism, for example, or you have some security mechanism to talk to the back end. We need to have something in there. GitHub is built secret scanning. And they said this is such a big issue that we really want to help the open source community as well. So this is now enabled for free on public repositories everywhere. They have already over 120 secret scanning partners. And at least once a month, there's a new one joining. It's amazing to see how this goes and grows. We started with uh, obfuscating all of the tokens that we have. So saying every token that is a 16 uh, character uh, string needs to be hexadecimal and that's it. Now nobody knows what is in there. Well, guess what? Hackers are smart as well. They can find out what is in there and just try it out. They know that you're landing on AWS, for example, and they try the token out. Those 120 secret scanning partners really contain everything from the major cloud providers, uh, providers uh, to Twilio, stuff like that. Anything that is generating an API token is now uh, generating it in a newer way as well, saying it doesn't need to be 16 uh, hexadecimal characters anymore, but we're going to prefix that with something that we can actually see what it is. Yes, we lose a little bit about the obscurity that we have, but now we can run a regular expression, say this thing starts with, for GitHub's example, for example, GHP, it's a GitHub personal access token. If we find that string combination with a length of 16, we are very confident that this is a personal access token to GitHub. So then we can actually go through this process, saying, hey, on every commit and push that is in there, GitHub stores the changes that you're pushing to GitHub, run those secret, uh, regular expression secret scanning patterns, and if something matches, they send it over to a verification endpoint of the secret scanning part. Going back to Azure, for example, saying, hey, this is a blob uh, SAS token. Is this something yours? It seems to be from the regular expression, but is it also actionable? And that information can be fed back into the system. An alert is generated on the GitHub side, and it even now annotates it saying, we've checked with the cloud scanning provi pri provider, and this is an actionable secret, so probably you want to do something with this. They even went a step further because this is running all the regular expressions after storing the delta on GitHub side. And I've actually done this and got a message from a competitor saying, hey, we found a GitHub API token in your code. If you buy our service, then this would have been prevented. People are actively monitoring the feed and checking for those things on open source repositories as well because it's highly uh, valuable data that they get. So they now enable push protection on repositories, saying while the, scan, while the data is coming in, we can scan the delta, it's regular expressions, and we have around 200 now uh, in the system, so they can run those scans. And if they see something, they just reject the push, saying we haven't stored it on the GitHub side, it's your problem, you can fix it client side. So it hasn't been leaked in that sense. This was enabled last week for all public repositories as well. You can go even into your account uh, and say this is enabled for everything that I have and force it that way as well. I have this, I thought I had a link in here. Um, yeah, github.com slash setting security analysis, that's your user account. And say for any new public repository, enable that thing and push protection as well. But be aware, so uh, initially this ran after a push event. Um, oh, I still need to update this one. When you enable this, this will also scan the entire history of the repository. Any commit, tag that is in there, any branch, because it could be in there. And anybody who gets a copy of your Git repository will have that information as well. And yes, people still find that. 
And still, I need to explain to developers, you cannot write a new commit, remove the secret, and push it. But this is where we are. So that is why this is so important. One thing good to note is that if you have a public repository and the secret is actionable, then there's a very high chance that the secret scanning partner will revoke your secret. You can imagine if this is the database connection string to your web shop in production, and they would yank your database connection, then your web shop wouldn't function anymore, and you couldn't make any sales. So there's some discretion on the secret scanning partner side to make a decision, do we want to revoke this, yes or no? And that's totally up to the secret scanning partner. One example, if you do this on github.com with a GitHub personal access token on a public repo, they will automatically revoke the personal access token for you, saying this thing has leaked, it has way too many options, we revoked it out of security precaution, and the user will get an email telling them we have revoked your token. If you leak it in a private repo, they say, well, you still have a chance to clean things up, we just give you an alert, and you have the chance to fix it. But it's up to you and your discretion then to do what you need to do with that. We, of course, usually advise people, just say the thing is, uh, uh, has leaked out, revoke it, and then uh, you can still work your magic. One example, again, if you enable this on your repositories and go to the security tab, you'll find secret scanning. In this case, we found an Azure storage account access key in here possibly an active secret, so they went out to the secret scanning partner and say, hey, do you actually know this one? Uh, this one is a bit obfuscated because it's hard to see what it is, so that is where the possibly active secret comes from. And you can even then find which person introduced this with which commit, where did we actually find that? So you can actually go back to the developer and say, hey, can we have a conversation about this? This is super trivial to get into your repository. This has happened to me as well, and I've been training people for three years on this. Just an end file that you accidentally commit and then you're screwed. Um, so be aware that we're all still humans, uh, but it is now good that we at least get alerts from this so we can act on this. Um, yeah. This has gotten now so good that they've even included this in issues, pull requests, and comments. Because apparently there are still developers who are communicating with their team saying, hey, use this API token and then you can get to work. But this is how leaks, of course, happen. I usually demo this, but for the sake of time, I'll skip over that. Uh, but with push protection, you just you get an error message even when you're on a git push that says, hey, we detected a secret in here, click on this link to learn more. You can still allow the push to go through, but then it's at least an action from a user that is audited later on as well, because it ends up in the audit log. But for the sake of time, I'll skip the demo uh, for that part. Because the last part is also super interesting. So that is secret scanning, something you can just enable on your account to get started with. Available for free for public repos. CodeQL, super interesting. CodeQL stands for Code Query Language. So we're querying our code base. And of course, that starts with a database. And if you have a database, we can write queries against that. There's a GitHub action that you can use. This is coming to Azure DevOps as well. You initialize an empty database. Uh, and then you can run with an analyze uh, action, you can run a query against your database. What we store in the database with CodeQL is what we call a graph traversal database. So we build up a database of your code saying method A is calling method B, which is doing something with the data it got through parameters, converting that and sending it into method C. If something happens on method C that we're doing something, like for example, logging user secrets in plain text, we can find the entry point of where did this data come from, and we can find where we actually spooled it in the log. That is why you have a graph traversal database. And find that information so we can say, hey, this is something we need to flag. That is where CodeQL comes into play. Again, free to use. It does run on your action minutes, so be aware of that. But it's at least good enough to get started with and really see what you can do with those uh, security features. It has some CLI support, so you can even play around with that locally in Visual Studio Code, for example, and write your own queries if you're really fond of that. The nice thing to note is this is a open source setup where the queries are being shared. What you now see that there's a lot of security um, researchers actively contributing to this repository saying, hey, I found a code, uh, a query that can find the coding pattern for the log4j attack, for example which means you don't need to write those queries yourself. You can build on top of what the community is building uh, and just um, use their power, of course. There's a lot of support for languages in here. 
these things, the repository now, I think last time I checked, had 300 pull requests merged in the last month. So super active, they're continuously building new queries, so it's very valuable to run this at least once a week in the background, saying check if you find some coding patterns. Even better of all the um, vulnerabilities that were triggered last year on the JavaScript community, they've, re, uh, after the fact, reran CodeQL on top of that, and 80% of the vulnerabilities and packages could have been found with these queries because there are known patterns. Looking at the time, I'll show you where you can find that information. Finish your demo, and then wrap things up. I'll be around later if you want to know more. Happy to show uh, lots more of this stuff as well. It's something you run in your pipeline, so in your workflows. It's something you ingest there, saying when we do a pull request, for example, run all the scans, uh, just to say if there's something in there. If there's a hit on one of the queries, automatically an alert is created. You have end-to-end -end traceability of where was this alert introduced, where did we find it, who, who did something. We have links back to the patterns saying clear text storage of sensitive information, not something you should do. Again, we can train ourselves as engineers to become better on this as well. The nice thing about this thing is the most uh, unassuming button on the screen saying we do something with the profile, that is where the issue has been found. We're clear text logging something, but we have no clue of what we're logging. And we have a whole description of why is this a bad idea. Well, the button I was talking about is called show paths. That is actually getting the information from the graph traversal database, saying we have a provision composer that starts with an app password, so that's probably sensitive data. Um, that goes to another method where we send in the app password and transpose that into a different object even. I think that is uh, the create result part that is shown here. So the app password gets sent into a constant. That constant gets sent into another method. We change it again, uh, move it into another object. And somewhere along the line, so you can find all of the, the traces that you have here. We have that profile that now has an app password somewhere underneath. We inject it into JSON stringify, chocolate white, and that is how things end up in the log. So you can really find the full path of what is happening inside your code base of why this is an issue. And there's tons of queries already available that run on this, something that is available for you for free in public repos. Now, there's a whole standard of output files called Serif, Static Application Results Interchange Format, that is now also being used by dynamic application security testing tools because CodeQL is a static application security tool. It looks at your source code and then tries to find out all the issues that are there. So these links are definitely uh, interesting to see. Definitely the middle one, CodeQL, and show the uh, uh, insights where you can see the activity in the repository. It's just mind-blowing how many people are building on this. And of course, I got some screenshots that I showed you just before. Um, and those were the things I wanted to highlight that you can enable on your repositories for free. I do have some time for questions. Of course, I want to get your information back, what you think about this session as well. If you want to grab the slides already, and don't want to wait until they are available in the app, you can go to this blog post, pick up uh, all of the slides that I'll publish later today, and get all the links that I've shared in here, because that can be super uh, valuable as well. I also got a LinkedIn learning course on this topic, so if you really want to dive deeper into that, you can check that one out as well. And with that, we're actually sharp at 50 minutes, so thank you so much, I hope I learned something.